code, test the code, um, vet the code. Also, some folks from our um, our headquarters in uh, in Silver Spring for doing policy work on it, and then also um, people from from interagency. So, so, so Joe and Hillary here from the USGS, Greg Busey from the National Ocean Service, Jeff Hansen from the Army Corps of Engineers, and Eve Marita there who's also working there. So, this is a very big collaborative project. By no means just uh, the work of one person. So what are we talking about? Um, over the past few years, um, with storms like Katrina, um, Sandy, Matthew that just came by, we are, at the Weather Service and as a country, we're realizing more and more that there is significant coastal hazard uh, threat posed by water. In the past, we've thought about hurricanes maybe as being mainly wind events that, that blow down houses, blow over houses. But really, if you look at the data, and this one was done by the National Hurricane Center, if you look at the data, then really the most fatalities are caused by something that's, that's related to, to water. So rain, surf, look at the storm surge, almost half the deaths due to storm surge. So more and more with Katrina, Sandy, Matthew, we're starting to think about hurricanes as, as water threats. And so what I'm going to show here today is the, the component of the coastal hazard posed by waves, near shore waves, which in itself is a risk hazard, the, the explosive force of waves on structures by the beach, but also um, as it relates to storm surge, um, and ultimately how these two things combine also with rain to, to have um, inundation over areas like this here. So, so this is a new system, an extension of, of what, we, what we used to have. And it's important to see how all of this fits in uh, into, the, into the, the structure of our products and how we help people uh, to stay safe during storms. So this is, in, in one slide, pretty much the product suite that we produce at the National Weather Service. So here, on the, on the horizontal axis, are various applications. Um, on, on this axis here are um, various products that we have at various time intervals. So when you have, for example, a big storm like hurricane, you need to know sometime in advance what's going to happen. And on a seasonal level, you need to plan to be able to have things in place to help evacuations in vulnerable areas like Key West or like the other banks in North Carolina. But also at the time of the storm, you need to have actionable information within a few hours. If you're a farmer, for example, in agriculture, you need to know uh, at a seasonal level what the weather is going to do. So you need to plant crops at a certain time and make a choice to do or not do certain actions. So, so we have a split um, at the weather service in terms of what we call weather. So, so things that we forecast at the scale of a few minutes, hours, or weeks. And these are things that, that touch life and property, aviation, for example, if you need to take a flight, you need to know the weather. If you're making a trip by boat or you're sailing containers across the Pacific, you need to know the scale of a few days, what's going to happen. But then if you're doing things like agriculture, etc., you need to know things at a longer scale. So, so we make this split between what we call weather and what we call climate. And what we talk about when we talk about storm surge and about waves and about the impact of waves, we're, we're pretty much within this scale of a few hours. Um, out to days, out to a week, where we have to produce forecast warnings and watches uh, based on those things. So what have we got in terms of wave forecasting? So for a long time we've had um, a global wave model called WaveWatch um, that runs over all the oceans. And this is forced by atmospherics. Uh, so, so we also have a global atmospheric model called the global forecast model, or GFS. And, um, and it runs over the globe and then forces the surface of the, of the, of the ocean and it produces big wave systems, for example, here in the Southern Ocean, um, in the Atlantic, and if you have a hurricane forcing, it could force the hurricane-associated waves up the coast. And if you take a zoom out here, in this case, you see a storm that's been generated off the coast here. So this has been running well and it helps shipping and it helps inform uh, surfers where to go. But if you look and, and, and just for reference, uh, here are the basic equations that we, that we use for this. So we're not, in fact, uh, solving the, uh, the, a, an equation that is a wave equation, ironically, since it's a wave model, but we're solving the statistical quantity of the wave field. So we solve, essentially, the variance of the sea surface, 
and that quantity is just solved with the transport equation with uh, some sources and sinks over here, and then some equations to, um, to relate the dynamics of the waves as they propagate over ocean currents and over bathymetry. And we run this on, uh, on global grids like this, here on the left. And so what you have here is a grid that, that spans at a half a degree resolution across the globe. And then going towards the coastline, it, it, it reduces um, in resolution down to seven and a half kilometers or four arc minutes. Um, and it's done in a, in a, in a two-way nesting sense. So if you have a wave system going over the Hawaiian Islands, it downscales to the islands and then it, it, it reinterprets back onto the coastal grids and can propagate through. So you get shadowing from the, from the islands in the wave field across here. However, if you look really close to the coast, and if you zoom in um, at the scale of one of our forecast offices, you see a picture like this. This is the actual resolution of seven and a half kilometers um, on this grid. And you can see suddenly uh, that resolution is not nearly enough to resolve any coastal processes. So for example, you have an inlet here where uh, maybe a small craft wants to go in and out, and you've got red current interaction, but you've got one grid point to compute all of that. So clearly, that's, uh, that's not sufficient. So um, we really had two needs. First of all, we needed to downscale um, the system considerably down to scales that uh, actual coastal processes occur at, or can be begun to describe that. And second of all, we wanted to improve the forcing on the model. So um, wave modeling, like coastal surge modeling, um, is a forced problem. Uh, so essentially, a lot of the solution is determined purely by, by the forcing of the atmospherics on the surface. So which model you use to force it with makes a big difference in your accuracy. The, the, the WaveWatch model, the global model, is forced by the GFS system, as I mentioned. Um, and that is just one, one of various models that we use when we produce our forecasts. And that model can be wrong. So this is an interesting example of a few years back um, with uh, Tropical Storm Debbie, 2012. Uh, this shows you a picture of all of the model runs that the Hurricane Center had at its disposal uh, to produce a forecast at the time of Tropical Storm Debbie. So it, it had a genesis here in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, you can see that pretty much half the models from various centers, from, 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 uh, from the Weather Service, from the European Center, from the UK Met Office, from the Australians, um, half of them said the storm is going to go this way, and half of them said the storm is going to go to the west. So, so if you pick any one of these models to force your wave model with, your wave model is going to be completely wrong, because in the end it turns out that the storm did go to the west, whereas um, the official um, GFS model uh, had it going out to the east. So if you use that in your wave model, your waves will be totally wrong. So what we wanted to do is have a model that would take the forecast consensus and force the wave model with that. So that means that when the forecasters take all of these component models and they look at that to decide what's going to be the official forecast that they put out to the public, that track there becomes the official forecast and that track is the one that we use to force our coastal wave model with. So, so we are doing two things with our model, both, both are, are very important. The first one is we downscale it to high resolutions and second of all we force it with the forecast field directly from the forecast offices, which is the consensus of all of the ensemble of model inputs. And we do that at um, 36 coastal locations, or coastal domains. So we split up uh, in the weather service into a number of regions. We have central region, which don't have too many waves except for the Great Lakes. But then we have eastern region, southern region, Puerto Rico, Rico, western region, Alaska region, and Pacific region. And each of these regions, we have, for every forecast office on the coast, we have a domain. And so they stack up like this, and so we end up with 36 offices. And then what each office is doing, okay, and here just for some, for some detail is, the, uh, is all of the components in the model. Essentially, it's, uh, it's the SWAN model that we run, and we have an enhancement in it to break up the wave systems in their component forces that I'll show. Um, and just uh, essentially the standard source terms um, in the default SWAN model, plus then uh, additions for wave run up and rip currents that I'll show, and these models run out to, to a four day um, period. And these are forced in with the, with the, um, the inputs from the forecast models, and this is, um, if you consider the whole system in its entirety is a schematic of what's happening, you've got the individual forecast offices, so 36 of these around the country, 
Each one of them prepare their forecast wind fields, which are essentially the consensus of all of the atmospheric forcings that they have available. Once they have that, they upload that through their regional uh, headquarters up to our com supercomputer um, that we maintain at NOAA. So essentially, almost like a cloud, the forecast officers can configure a run with the various settings that they want, their inputs, and when they want to run it. They hit the run button and the, the files get uploaded and they get processed on the supercomputer and once the runs are done, they get sent back by our satellite network back into their computers, into the display systems. And we also do that at the National Hurricane Center. They sent us regional, regional hurricane fields. So this is a new way of doing things within the weather service because normally what we do is we have um, models running on the supercomputer and it just has this one way output regime. So we don't ask any inputs from forecasters. We essentially run numerical models using observations for data simulation, but essentially it's a one-way street. So the new thing about this model here is that it's actually triggered by forecast officers and it uses their inputs. So actually we have a human component inside of the forecast. And all of that is to improve the accuracy. So as you can imagine, that, that makes for quite a complex pattern of use of the system. Uh, so what you see here is a schematic of really a run log of all of the runs in a typical day that gets processed in the system. So on the right hand side here, every block is one of these 36 forecast offices across the whole country. On the horizontal axis here is the timeline, so this represents 24 hours of uh, forecasting. And each bar here represents when an office is triggering an underground run. So some offices you can see trigger runs uh, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, around the 6 Z uh, time and, and 18 Z time. Some offices run the model every three hours because their conditions change often, so they need to have a refresh, a, a new opinion of the weather conditions often. So for example, our Sterling office uh, in the DC area, since the Chesapeake is such a, such a changeable situation, they need to run the model often. And some offices, like our Alaska offices, they feel having one run per day is sufficient. So what you can see here is we don't control the time at which they run it or how many times they run it. So if you have a situa an area where you've got a specific situation like Hurricane Matthew, something is happening, the need to have actionable information very often, you can run it as often as you like and we have the capacity available to do that and, in and the infrastructure. And if you add all of these together, you get a usage diagram like this. And this is quite interesting to see because essentially it's sort of a chaotic process because people can submit runs whenever they want to. But it's interesting to see that it does sort of organize itself around two types <coughs> of use. So roughly about uh, around the uh, 6 Z or 6 UTC time and 18 UTC is when most offices uh, submit the run. And I split this also out in terms of um, the offices on the Gulf Coast and East Coast, which are in blue here, and the ones towards the west of the country. Uh, in red, and they, as the sun moves across the country, they submit the runs later. So you can see there's a there's a spread of usage, and so that allows us to to basically economize on our resources, our computational resources. So we don't have to provide the equivalent of 36 times all of the cores that every model wants to use because we can we can spread it out um, and get away with fewer pure computational cores. So here are some examples of what the, what the model results look like and the type of fidelity that we get out of this. Um, so, so as I mentioned, um, the base resolution that we currently have with the system is one vertical mile, but in some cases we nest down to 500 meters or less uh, to get to very specific coastal details. So for example, this is what it looks like over the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and so in this case you can see um, the very strong effect of the, of the very tall mountains here on the big island. Uh, which funnels winds, you get this really strong um, uh, jet of winds and they generate this really concentrated fields of waves in the gaps here. Very dangerous for shipping. If you zoom in on Oahu here, you can see the really complex wave fields. So you've got the easterly trade winds here, um, and you've got some refraction here on the point here. And then here from the south you get these mild swells um, that go into Waikiki Beach and, and Pearl Harbor here. Here's some more examples from, from Alaska. Here is uh, Kotzebue Sound, and these white spots here are ice fields, if you include, so ice blocks waves. Um, so you get shadowing behind the waves here. Uh, this is Juneau, also in Alaska. Um, 
So this is a very complex fjord-like area. We had to resolve the one kilometer resolution to get all of these fjord uh, structures in there. And we go, we, we uh, nest down all the way into features like this. So this is Columbia River mouth, um, which uh, also includes breakwaters here, and you can see the shadowing effects. We put that with obstacles inside of Swan. So we get down to resolutions like that in the system. So a very important physical process also is, is wave current interaction, um, especially around, around these waters. Uh, that's something new also that we have in the system. Uh, so if you look at the dynamic equations of the model, you have um, various dependencies on the currents. So, so both within the so-called uh, dispersion relationship here, waves get shortened and elongated on uh, current gradients. That can become very dangerous for shipping. So uh, for example, here's the Gulf Stream around Florida, and here's the associated wave field. And if you let the video loop a little bit, you can see here, um, when the waves are coming headlong onto gradients in the current, they can sharply increase in wave height. And these are very, very dangerous uh, shipping conditions for, for ships uh, going out of Miami or the Palmas and things like that. So, so that's a very important coastal hazard that, we, uh, that we're able to capture here. And those currents are wind-driven or also tidal? Uh, the Gulf Stream is, is, uh, is, is basically um, um, a bar barotropic, uh, bar bar barotropic current, so it's, it's, it's both wind effects, um, density effects, continuity effects. So, um, so for this, this, this we run with our operational ICOM model. So we, we call that RTOPS Global. Um, so, so this, this takes into account much more than just the wind forcing on the surface. But not tides. Not tides, yeah. yeah. So, so in, the, in, the case of, in the case of this model, uh, tides are actually a very short time scale effect. So that makes the model really stiff, uh, numerically speaking. Uh, so they actually don't include it. So, so what, we, what we are going to do in the future um, to get to place the Columbia River mouth, of course, some of that is tidal driven as well. Uh, so fortunately, the National Ocean Service has um, uh, if, typically FECOM based nestings inside of RTOPS. And so that's actually a much better source for, for getting into and out to uh, out, of, out of those inlets. Um, this is the first current model that we've used, uh, simply because it was really important for the Miami domain. Um, but we've seen that um, also the wind-driven component, um, they, they don't really resolve the wind-driven currents that well in this model, so that we get in some cases um, exaggerated wave current interaction, <coughs> just, just working up with the RTOPS. Plus, it's, it's only a 12th of degree uh, model resolution, so <coughs> it's, it's good for the Gulf Stream, but once you get close to the coast, it, it starts to break down. So it's an important process, but uh, our RTOPS model is not necessarily the best one for really close to the coast. Um, so, so if you look at, at, a, at a typical wave field, um, in some cases you can see, sometimes if you look out of the airplane window, um, a very clear, very long crested pattern of waves fly over the Pacific. But in most cases you have a complex wave field where you've got various wave directions and various frequencies all in one on the wave, uh, in, in the wave field. That's because you have systems that uh, weather systems in various places that generated waves that are crossing any given point in the ocean, plus you can have a local storm that generates local wind sea in that place. So a spectral wave model like WaveWatch and SWAN, um, they contain all of that information inside of the model, and when they solve it, they solve um, this quantity called the directional wave spectrum, which carries uh, a range of frequencies, a range of directions, and the variance associated with every combination of those. But typically, this is a lot of information for us to handle. So in, in research, you would, you would sometimes look at these individual spectra and, and look at the interaction between that and sediment or, or whatever other process you're studying. But in operations, that's too much information to handle. So we've typically taken just the integral of this and some specific characteristics like the peak frequency or the peak direction, and we've communicated that out. So for example, the animation that I showed of the colors the, the wave patterns, that's just the integral of all of these, this information. However, in, in many cases, that is, again, maybe too simplified way to view the, the wave field. So we want something in between. So 
what we do with, uh, with this neutral system is that we are doing what we call wave partitioning. And that is grouping the energy into its um, major components um, that can be grouped together. So for example, if you look at this directional wave spectrum here, you can clearly see an energy peak here and here, and you see maybe this broad area which you can group together as, 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 as one phenomenon. And we can label this as a swell one and a swell two, and we can label this, um, since it's at higher frequencies, um, and since its phase velocity, the, the velocity at which the waves are moving, is associated with the local wind sea, we can label that as a local wind sea system. So we have an algorithm to pick out and organize the system like that. It's, it's, it's called the inverse catchment method by Vincent and Swall. And once we run that at all of the individual points in, in the model grid, we can get what we call a partitioned field um, of systems at every grid point. And so that is pretty good because then you can do a lot of things with it. You can take as a forecast office, you can say, well, there is a, a 14 second swell which will be great to surf on. It's going to be two feet or six feet. So that's going to be great to surf on. Um, for small craft harbor, uh, for small craft, we've got um, a, a dangerous wind sea out today. And maybe for shipping, there will be a very long swell that will create resonance with big containers. So you need to watch out for that. So that information is really useful to have these individual wave systems. However, uh, just running the algorithm at every grid point is actually not enough because if these are the various grid points in your domain, that's just the schematic of the land, then mathematically there's no, um, no certainty that if you run the algorithm on any given point that its neighbor would have the same result because gradually as you go across the domain, what becomes the most important energy component varies. So you actually need to run an additional algorithm on top of this to make sure that there's spatial and temporal consistency between um, these partitions that you identify. So, so we run this thing called the spiral tracking and it has an algorithm that, 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 that runs through the domain and it goes from grid point to grid point and associates the various um, partitions that were identified with its neighbors and it keeps track of it in space and it keeps track of it in time. And so once we've done that work, we end up with some pretty neat visuals. So, uh, so, so again, each one of these uh, uh, geographic grid points has um, all of these partitions, and we track it in space and time. And so, for example, here for Hawaii, we now split out wave system one, wave system two, and wave system three, and we plot the wave height of just that component and its directions. Um, and the frequency or period and its directions. And you can see um, a wind sea system here, the system coming from the east, and we just saw a swell system that rolled through, and we're just seeing a new swell system um, that's developed. Maybe we can run it through again. So what you can see in the wind sea system from the east is that um, it's fairly short crested, so it feels, um, it feels the bathymetry a lot and it's got a very wide directional spread, so you can see quite some directional change behind the islands. This is a swell system of a low wave height, but a, but a fairly fairly long period, and it's, it's quite long crested because it's got a distant source and it casts a very long shadow. And so in time, as, as, as the faster waves get to the domain first and leave, the period reduces, and here a new wave system has rolled in, and it's got a very long period you can see pretty warm colors across the domain. So this information can then be used by forecasts in an easy way because they can pick up and say, well, there's going to be a wind sea system of about three meters. There's going to be this very um, low wave height swell system of 12 uh, second period. And there's going to be a third system of uh, pretty long, but with a quite, a, quite a high wave height. They can forecast those separately. Moving closer to the coast, we have also incorporated two coastal hazards, two, uh, two aspects that have become really important um, um, in terms of protection of life and property to, to um, the public and, and hence to our forecasters. The first of them is, is wave run up, and that's actually the reason why I'm, I'm here this week uh, working with Joe and Hillary. <coughs> um, and uh, I promised Joe I would not do a whole talk on just this one to find it because he needs to do it at some point himself. <laughs> so I just have one slide on it. Uh, but essentially, I'll introduce the topic. So, um, so I said at the beginning that, that waves are an important hazard in themselves, but it also has an impact on coastal <coughs> surge. 
um, because of the, the transfer of momentum of the waves into the <coughs> Um, and one of the components there um, is, is the, or two components really important. Um, one is the <coughs> gradual transfer of, of, of the momentum of the waves to the mean flow of radiation stresses. Um, that, that causes a mean setup in the, in the water level by the sea. But then within the period of the wave, there's this sloshing up and down um, uh, of the waves that we call wave runner. And so the combination of tides plus the wind-driven surge component plus the wave-driven surge component plus this runner component, all of that gives you a total water level that you can compare to a dune elevation to decide whether either your dunes will start to be damaged during a given storm or will overtop and inundate the, the area in the back. Um, so since we have these very high resolution wave models, we, uh, we are able to extract pretty close to the coast um, data that we can feed into an empirical model to produce these results. So if you want to simulate uh, or describe things like wave runup, um, sort of on first principles, you need a lot of computational power, and a lot of grid resolution and temporal resolution. Um, we don't have that in operation. So, so what we do here is we run an empirical model that's been trained on observation. And, and so given the, uh, the high resolution um, and near shore data that we have for the waves, we can run it through this model, and then at every grid point where we extract it, we can com compose a time series like this, where you can see the various components of all of the effects that we're including. So uh, this is at the North Carolina Outer Banks goes, and if we take this point, for example, here, we get a tidal oscillation here, right at the bottom of the, the dashed line. And then once we add all of the components in that the waves cause to it, um, we get this, this, uh, this solid blue line, so which is quite a bit above the tide level. And we can compare that with these levels here, the red horizontal and the black here, which represents the dew uh, toe and the dew crest. And then once the oscillating line goes over one of those lines, we know that we've, we've reached a risk threshold of either inundation or erosion. But there's a complication to this because the coastline is not static. Uh, before and after a storm, this coastline changes. It changes due to literal transport over time, slowly. So there's uncertainty in, this, in the slopes. We don't have the physical, practical capacity to measure um, all of the slopes across the whole country in front before we do every forecast, obviously. So we have a database of variation of how much the shoreline can change at that location. And some areas are calm, and the shoreline doesn't change too much. Some areas are very violent, and they change a lot. So we have a spread of coastlines, um, as slopes. So, so above this blue line that we wish we knew for sure, we don't. Um, so, so there's a variation, there's uncertainty. And so that uncertainty band um, is the light blue shaded area around it. So for every location, we also have that uncertainty. Once we take all of this information, we integrate it in time, we're able to produce this plot over here, um, which gives you, um, at each location, the risk of either um, the, the, the water level touching the dune toe, eroding it, or overwashing it. And we, we plot that in different bands here. Joe does that with his group. Um, and so we can see immediately if an area is in danger of either having the water level reach the dune, which is for collision here, um, being eroded for erosion, or fully inundating. So areas that are red here, so for example this, this zone here, is at risk of being inundated for this storm. So a very important coastal hazard, and we're working with the Hurricane Center to, to uh, try to incorporate this into their forecasts. And the second important uh, coastal hazard that we have included in the system is, is rip currents. Uh, rip currents are really important for beachgoers. It's actually the number one killer of, of people on the beach um, in the US. Um, per year, hundreds of rescues and a few deaths uh, due to rip currents. So, so it's a really big deal, and forecasters really would like to have a better way to produce forecasts based on these. Just like with the wave runner, uh, you can do a really good job of writing the dynamical, uh, even DNS numerical model to produce little rip currents for a given test case if you know the bad beat fully and you can wait for a long time for simulation. But in an operational sense, that's simply not possible. So again, we have to, uh, we have to apply empirical models. So, um, so Dusek and Syme, um, they're working with us, they produced an empirical model, basically a trained regression model, uh, which you can see down here, uh, which takes into account some 
typical factors that you would imagine has an impact, have an impact on, on rip currents. They ran the regression model, they came up with these coefficients, um, and they're able to produce um, forecasts of the likelihood of a rip current. So, uh, so just briefly here, um, it has, as you might expect, dependencies on wave height, dependencies on wave direction, uh, dependencies on water level, so typically rip currents are the highest of the falling tide. Um, and also this parameter here, uh, which is a reflection of whether or not there is a possibility of having a rip channel uh, in the bathymetry. So we don't yet currently have a way to track changes in bathymetry during the process of forecasting. We would like to do that, but uh, right now we don't. So we have a proxy for that. And the proxy is that if there was a storm in the past three days, then it's likely there's been scouring, and that that has formed the rip channel, which can guide rip currents today. So, so that is an additional factor that's worked in here, uh, labeled EP. So the way that all of this works is, is demonstrated in this, this schematic here. So we've got um, an axis of significant wave height. So the higher the wave height, the more likely rip currents. But there's this, um, this important jump at about half a meter, where the rip probability becomes pretty important. So actually, not the highest waves, but waves of about one meter, it turns out, cause rip currents the most. Um, there's also a, a factor of wave direction. And then there's a factor of, of water level, as I mentioned. And so the combination of all of those uh, give you that prediction. So, so if, you, if you go here, for example, I, I pulled out. So, so we've, got, we've got four, five um, um, pilot sites that we've set up. And for example, here, this is in your neighborhood, um, we have uh, a collection of output points where we do this calculation. And this was during um, Hurricane Hermine where you can see, if you, if you go to any one of these points here, uh, we get a time series of wave heights. So you can see the wave heights that approached about two meters during Hermine, um, beginning of September. Uh, this was the peak period. It was, it was a fairly low peak period, so it was an actively growing wind sea. Um, the waves were, were pretty close to shore normal. And because all of these parameters were just in that right sweet spot, there was, was a very large increase of risk of rip currents um, during Hermine um, along this, this, this coast here. Whereas normally it's actually pretty calm, um, but during Hermine there was, uh, there was an important increase in risk. So uh, talking about model validation, of course it's really important once you have a, an operational system to be able to validate and look at the results and make sure they are they're working well. Um, we have, we have within an operational context, we really have various needs for validation. So, as model builders, developers, you want to make sure that what you put out there in operations are working well. Um, so, what we do is we do retrospective <coughs> runs. We take long, like year-long retrospective runs, and we do comparisons of results over long periods of time. Um, and every every day, we do a, a 30-day rolling hindcast. Perspective on our results. So that's one, and that's really important. But then also for the forecasters, they need to know um, on any given point how the model is being is performing. So when they're putting out their forecast today, they need to know has the model been been um, adding a bias to the results, to the observations today for the last few days, uh, or is it is it pretty much on track? So we need both scatter plot results over retrospective times, and we have we have a need for real-time results, time series, um, so that at any given point in time they can see how the model is performing. So for both of those requirements, we, we have a, a model validation page, which you can check out yourself as well. Um, and so for example here we can, uh, we can zoom in and we can do a few things, so, so we, can, uh, we can look at, at animations of the, of the wave model results. So this is the, the forecast office here in Tampa. Uh, so these are the waves and there happens to be a, a storm that's approaching, um, which you might see soon. These are the associated wind fields. These are the associated currents. You can just see the edge of the Gulf Stream. I, I, I don't think that what you're looking at on the screen is showing. Oh, it's not showing. Okay. No, you have to drag it. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. <coughs> yeah. Maybe I need to fix this. Oh, that's not working like that. Okay. It's, it's okay. 
Anyway, at your leisure uh, tonight. <laughs> Click on this link, it's really cool. <laughs> anyway, I'll just show here. Um, so, so for example, we have uh, a validation page. It's, it's basically uh, it's, it's a Google Earth type uh, navigational page um, based on history of ArcGIS. Um, these, uh, these diamonds here are uh, NDBC Witherboot and then Scripps uh, GUIs. Um, so they give us real-time uh, data of winds, uh, wind direction, wind period, wind height. Um, and so at each of these points, we are able to produce these time series plots. So these are for the forecasters really to know how the model's been performing over the past few cycles. Uh, so you can see here a six-day period. So this is now, um, and it has a four-day window forwards. And you can see for two days back how the model's been doing. This is wave height, uh, wave period, wave direction. And this is a comparison, a feather plot between um, the observed and the model winds. So essentially what the forecasters are putting into the model in the forecast. And what we plotted on here in red are the observations, and then um, three colors here are three, the, the most recent and the, the two historical cycles of NWPS, the neutral model. And then for comparison, we also have the global way watch model. <coughs> and the fact that you can't see much difference between everything is cool today, um, it's working well. Um, in terms of the, uh, the retrospectives, uh, here's just an example of what, the, what two of the regions have been doing. Um, or three of the regions really, Pacific and Alaska region. So this is Hawaii and Guam, and this is all of the offices around uh, Alaska over a five month period. Um, so the comparisons we make are, are at four forecast windows. So we want to know how the model is performing uh, within one day's forecast, and within two days forecast, within three days and four days. And so since the wind forcing is, is uh, initial condition dependent, you'd imagine that for the near shore forecast, um, well, sorry, the, 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 the short time scale forecast, the quality will be better. And as you go further out in time, and when you go past one week, the quality will deteriorate. And so that's also what you see here. Uh, so 24 hours from now, the forecast is, is, is pretty good. And then um, add one day, two days out, still pretty good, three days out, four days out. And, and so as you go further, you can start seeing that the statistics start to deteriorate. Um, so, so this is the wave height, this is the, 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 the input wind field. So you can see that the quality of the waves are pretty well a reflection of the quality of the inputs into the winds. Or to put it another way, you can have a really, good, a really good wave model with really good physical descriptions, but if the input winds are not good, you're always going to see a bias in the, in, in the wave results. Unfortunately, we're always tied by the hip uh, to, to wind field. So that's always uh, the reason why we do a comparison also with the wind field. Uh, this is what it looks like in the, in, on the west coast. Uh, so more observations because there are more offices and more breweries there. Uh, but similarly, you can see um, a gradual deterioration in, in the quality as you go out in time. At this particular point, we still had quite a positive bias um, that we needed to get rid of. Turns out that that was due to the surface currents from the, from the icon based model um, that were ever predicting the wave current interaction. So that was the reason for the error estimation here. And moving forward, we will uh, we will reduce that dependency, um, and I've already seen that that, that improves the bias significantly. Um, so so again, you, you can see some correlation between uh, uh, between the, the, the wind inputs and the wave heights, but specifically here also the, the, the influence of the currents was a was a big one. Um, so finally, some some examples of of um, how the model performed during Hurricane Matthew. Uh, so you recall recently it, it went past. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico here in Haiti, in the Caribbean Sea, made a very sharp right hand turn and went up here, um, out the, the Florida east coast, and went out to sea here. So this was a very good example or test case for our system because um, the vortex went straight through our model domains um, as it went up the coast. So it was a really nice time to, uh, to, to check the performance of the model. So here we're looking at the Jackson World Forecast Office, and we're seeing here the vortex uh, going through the domain. So this vortex is not the vortex of any specific model that the Hurricane Center has. So it's not the European Center model or H4 or GFS. It's the consensus model. So they look at all the guidance that decide what's the consensus. That's what they force this model with. Um, and then they also uh, they also come up with a, a few parameters to describe that consensus model in terms of maximum radius of wind, central pressure, etc. And then they build an idealized vortex out of that, and they graph that on top of a background atmospheric field. So that's why um, the vortex looks kind of perfect in this case. Uh, that's because it's a forecasted product. 
Um, but the benefits of that is that the track is accurate, the track is as good as it can be, um, and the, the wind speeds are as accurate as it, as it can be. So that's the wind, um, and then that forces the waves over here. You can see, especially on the north uh, eastern quadrant, high waves, and the wind uh, pretty close to these buoys over here actually took out one of the buoys uh, down at Melbourne. Um, so I couldn't show that one. Um, so in addition to, to the wind forcing, we also have the water level forcing that we include. And in this case, this is to show you the difference in, 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 the, uh, in the, the surge model results that we have available to force the model with. Um, S-TOPS is our ad surge based model, um, and P-SURGE is an older model, slosh uh, based mm -hmm. model, but uh, it's very computationally cheap, so we can run a large ensemble with it, so you actually have a, a, a probabilistic forecast. Um, but you can see quite significant differences in the water levels, and that has a very important difference also in the wave heights that are associated with it. Um, but if you look at the at the um, at those two buoys at Jacksonville, so NEBC 1112 and 1113, um, we see really encouraging results. So uh, so down at uh, at the southern buoy, um, we got observed waves of 14 feet, so really high. Um, and both the uh, the global wave watch model did a decent job of catching that peak, both in terms of amplitude and in timing. Um, and similarly, the, the near shore wave breaking system um, had a really good match in the observations for the wave period. Uh, when we look at the northern buoy, for example, um, the, the global wave watch model showed its deficiencies both in terms of the wind forcing, which was forced by this GFS model, um, and its resolution. So you can see that the, the, the wave watch model underestimated this peak um, at that buoy, which is 20 feet by quite a bit. Um, even though the timing was right. Um, but that was due to the fact that GFS um, was forecasting way too much to the east. And so in our model, the forecasters had the opportunity to correct that because they're looking at the, the ensemble um, consensus results. So forcing the model with the ensemble consensus results, we managed to, uh, to capture the peak pretty well, uh, both in wave height and in terms of period. Which color is the, whole, the, the consensus? Um, it's 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 the black one, the grey one, and the blue one. Um, so the black one was the cycle at, at uh, August six, the zero Z. So so this one running out to here, um, and then the next cycle of the next day was zero Z. So it started here, so it filled in that space, and then uh, twelve Z, pretty much after the storm has passed, started here and around here. So you basically have to tile in your mind them together because that was the guidance that they had. To, uh, to, uh, to forecast the storm. So if you add all of the buoys uh, together in the mix, you get a scatter plot like this. And so in general, the model performed uh, pretty well um, at, at pretty much all of these forecast horizons. So one day, two day, three day, four day. So, so even at four days, they had, a, they had a, um, a pretty good heads up of what the conditions were going to be at that station. So uh, just to finish up some future work, um, and also part of the reason why I'm here, um, is that we um, are, for the next uh, 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 year's work, uh, before our next implementation, we are switching out um, our current system of using regular grids uh, in the SWAN model with unstructured meshes. And the reason for that is that um, right now, when we are doing the forecasting for the rip currents and the wave runoff, um, we have to nest down to quite some high resolutions to be able to get to the resolution by the coast of 500 meters that we need. Um, that's very cumbersome with a regular grid and nesting scheme, uh, so it's much more logical to use some um, unstructured measures that you can do that for a whole domain uh, with a smooth transition. Uh, so we're currently building uh, 10 of these, uh, 10 of our 36 domains we're converting over to unstructured grids. Um, and so for example, for Tampa, it looks like this. Uh, and this is going to be based on our, our uh, hurricane storm surge model, which is at certain structure. And so for Tampa, it looks like this. So you can see the resolution is, is down to about uh, 500, 300 meters um, in these grid cells here. And so that gets us to the resolution that we need uh, to drive um, this, uh, this, these runoff models at high resolution all across the coast, and similarly for, uh, for the wave runoff models here. So to conclude, um, the Neosho wave prediction system that I showed here is an unmount system, high resolution, downscaling, wave model guidance. Uh, now for all the offices in the coastal regions of the US, so up to uh, the 36 domains. Um, 
The fact that they are driven by the forecast of consensus winds makes wave conditions, forecast and wind conditions totally consistent. We improve the accuracy um, of the global wave model. Um, it's, it's including these effects, um, the water levels and surface currents, so especially tides and surge events, also important uh, effects like the Gulf Stream, um, in the case of Florida from the HICOM model, the other wave partitioning, uh, because that splits up and gives more definition to the forecast than just the integral quantities. Um, and very important for us nowadays, uh, the inclusion of coastal hazards of wave runoff and number of currents um, to project life and property in the US. Thank you, any questions?